Welcome to another video. So we're going to be looking at um, the 17th topic in our series of germ biology lectures. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at natural habitats. Let's quickly look at the germ syllabus, what the, the, the syllabus requires. So under natural habitat, you are expected to know what um, the types of the habitat that exist. So you have aquatic, for example, pond, stream, lakes, seashores, and mangrove swamps, and also terrestrial stroke arboreal habitat. For example, you have the treetop of oil palm and abandoned farmland or a dry grassy savanna field, and of course a burrow or a hole. Now, specifically, candidates should be able to associate plants and animals with each of these habitats. And also, candidates should be able to relate adaptive features to the habitat in which an organism lives. Very straightforward. And this might be the shortest topic in the syllabus. Okay, so, having said that, a habitat is any environment in which an organism lives naturally. It is an area where physical and chemical constituents required by organisms are met. We mentioned earlier there are two types. You have the main um, aquatic habitats, which is related to water, and you have the terrestrial habitat, which is related to land. And of course, um, aquatic habitat will be further divided based on um, depending on the type of water. So you could have marine habitat, you could have um, estuarine habitat and you could also have um, the freshwater habitat all right also um like i mentioned each of these habitats have specific characteristics so you should be able to tell what are the characteristics of a marine habitat what are the characteristics of an estuarine and what are the characteristics of um, a freshwater habitat so if you are using the book explicit biology they are just listed there and you can find them in any other biology textbook so but for this video i'm using the book explicit biology which is the book i've written for jam exam and this is one book i can say specifically covers the jam syllabus it's not actually for other kind of exam well it might be useful for work and other exam but it's specifically written for the jam exam so i won't waste much time on the notes so because we just want to consider questions and answers um also before i move to terrestrial habitat let me show you this um illustration of let me show you this illustration that is explaining the different habitat so basically what you have here like i mentioned earlier aquatic habitat comprises of marine estuarine and fresh water so what you see here to my left is the estuarine zone now Estuarine is characterized by um, fluctuating salinity. So the salt, um, salt concentration changes because it's actually very exposed to, it's between fresh water and, um, and salty water. So estuarine is a transition between a river and the sea. So that's why the salinity is always fluctuating. Also, another characteristic is that um, the species diversity here is very low. There are not many species here. Also, the turbidity increases, especially during the rainy season. So, what is turbidity? Turbidity is the visibility. How you can, how much can you see when you take a look at the water? How far can you see into the water? The depth of visibility is what is called turbidity. So, during the rainy season, the turbidity is high because the water is more transparent at that time. But in the dry season, the turbidity is low. You're going to come, out, come across questions like that. Also, one character, another characteristic of estuarine habitat is that they have very low oxygen content. And also, they have very high productivity because of high nutrient level. So, the organisms, the plants in that in estuar, estuarine zone, they flourish very well because they have access to high nutrient level. So, that's what you, you, you get in the estuarine zone. But if you move further away from there, you will come into the fresh water. You have the fresh water habitat, which is in this case now, if you move away here, this is the fresh water. All right. Now, in the, the fresh water, it's called fresh water because of its low salt content. And it can either be running 
or it can be stagnant. So when the freshwater habitat is running, it is called lotic. And when it is stagnant, it is called lentic. Examples of, um, examples of freshwater habitat would include rivers and ponds. So for river, you know, river is running. So river is lotic. Then pond is stagnant, right? So pond, I mean pond or ponds are lentic. I haven't said that. Some of the characteristics will include low salt content. Number two, um, the oxygen at the surface of the water is more than the, the oxygen concentration at the bottom. So as you move down inside, the oxygen uh, concentration reduces. Also, current, that's the movement of um, tide, the rise and fall in the water level. Okay, Current can affect the distribution of gases, salt and small organisms for example in the river or in the stream also the water is shallow when you talk about freshwater habitat it's shallow and of course light can penetrate more in running water than in stagnant water so running water are clearer so they have a higher turbidity which is visibility into the water and also the water bodies are usually small all right now, if we then move to the marine habitat, so that is the, the main aquatic habitat. Marine habitat could either be ocean or high sea water bodies. And it is characterized by high salt concentration. The pressure increases with depth as you move down um, 1,000 atmosphere. As, as you move down, the, 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 the pressure increases. Also, the surface current is driven by wind. The tides occur due to alternative rise and fall in water level. Also, the high sea is relatively alkaline. And light can only penetrate up to 200 meters. So if you look at, take a look at this image, light can only penetrate this zone called euphotic zone, which is between zero to 200 meters deep. So anything, anything beyond this, then the visibility be difficult so if you take a look again at this um, marine habitat you realize that it's divided into major zones for example on this side you have the continental shelf you can see the continental slope here you can see what i mentioned earlier the euphotic zone you have the entire zone you have the abyssal zone and okay there are other zones that are not shown in this picture for example you could have the splash zone which is just above the the high tide mark so the splash zone is just at the top here you can also have the littoral zone so the littoral zone is another name for the euphotic zone and then you have this battle zone is can also be called the subtidal zone so that is just the description for the aquatic habitat now let us talk about the terrestrial habitat. Terrestrial habitats, of course, are related to land. And they can be divided into marsh, rainforest, grassland, and arid land. So for the marsh, let me see. I think I have an image here. Okay, let's look at this together. This doesn't cover the entire um, description. Let me see another image here. Okay, still doesn't, but then I'll just keep this picture up. So you have what you call the the marsh, which is a lowland soil that is usually flooded. So then as you begin to move further away from the marsh, then you will come in across the rainforest. Then from the rainforest, you have the grassland. If you move away from the rainforest, you have the grassland. And from the away from there, you have the arid land, which are dry land. Okay, so, so you are moving from marsh, which is water flooded, to rainforest, from rainforest to grassland, and from grassland to arid land. So that is showing that is um, in terms of increasing dryness. So marsh to rainforest to grassland to arid land. It's in that order. Now, I won't say that. The marsh is a lowland soil that is usually flooded. I said that earlier. It stands between the aquatic and terrestrial habitats. So you can have example found in dry pond or lakes as well. 
So, and there are specific plants that usually occupy these habitats. For example, pennywort. They are specifically called marsh pennywort. Then you have the onward, like water lilies as well. If you remember the plant called the duckweed, all these can be found in the marsh habitat. And of course, there are specific animals too that occupy that, occupy that um, habitat. For example, fishes, salamander, frogs, toad, lizards, snakes, birds, and mammals are found in this um, marsh habitat. Then when you talk about the rainforest, the rainforest, of course, is also constituted by plants and animals. Now, the rainforest is it, it is drier compared to the marshland, and it has more vegetations. So you have scatter trees, you have continuous layers of trees, and you have um, you have plants that have the ability to climb on other plants. For example, epiphytes that will grow on other plant plants, or you can also have the wild yam growing on another plant. Of course, um, this the plant that you find here also they possess buttress root for strong anchorage. For example, the silk cotton, and of course they have broad leaves in order to enhance their rate of transpiration. And you, of course, you also have plants that have. Um, okay, I mentioned that already. Plants that climb on other plants for support. And the kind of animals you find in a tropical forest would be animals that are protected by camouflage that can easily blend into the environment and be unnoticed. So some are adapted to climbing. For example, monkeys, they do so by grasping pad. They also have tails that they can use to hold onto tree branches. So you can also have others that have a grasping scale, for example, the snake. And you have birds that also make use of their feathers. So that's what you find in, the, in a tropical forest. Then if you move away from tropical forest, then you will have a grassland. Now grassland could be divided into um, a temperate grassland or a tropical grassland, depending on where you find yourself. For example, um, in, in Nigeria, for example, you can have a savanna or tropical grassland. It's usually found um, Okay, I mentioned you can find that in some states in southern Nigeria. And uh, if you're if you're moving from Lagos, for example, and you're driving to, let's say, Yobe, you would have come across different um, terrestrial habitats. Driving from Nigeria, uh, driving in Nigeria from, let's say, Delta to to say Ben, no, no, to say Boronu, you would have tra traversed different terrestrial habitats. I like to travel within Nigeria to the north and you get to see, to appreciate this transition from um, rainforest or tropical forest to grassland and then to desert. I've made a trip in the past to, to Yobe State and you could, you could actually tell this transition. And finally, okay, let, let's look at some common characteristics of this tropical grassland. You have the presence of intensive sunlight and high temperature. Rainfall is unevenly distributed. You have humidity that is always low and you have the presence of deciduous plants and also you have trees which are fire resistant they're common because there is constant bush burning in grassland and also the habitat have a whole range of herbivores such as squirrel you have grass cutter antelope rodents are found in this tropical grassland and you can also have some carnivores, I mean, some carnivores that prey on herbivores in this kind of um, grassland. For example, you will find leopards, you will find lion in this grassland. Okay, finally, the arid land, they are divided into the hot arid land, where you have the temperature as high as 77 degrees Celsius. For example, the hot desert and the semi desert. And you can also have the cold arid land where temperature is never up to, to zero degrees Celsius. It's sub-zero. Let's give an instance of a, pl a, a place in Russia called Siberia. So that, that is also an arid land. So the idea of arid land is that it's dry. It, nothing is really flourishing there. Okay, so the ecosystem is unstable. The soil may be rocky or sandy. It can be extremely windy. Also, there is a high evaporative stress 
and the rainfall is always very low. So as a result of that, there are no much. The ecosystem is not is not flourishing. You can't have um, much going on in terms of the ecosystem there. So it's extremely too hot or extremely. It's, I mean, either extremely hot or extremely cold. So with that, we'll come to the um, description of this um, topic 17, which is natural habitat. Now let's move on to the important part, which is to look at how questions are framed in the JAM exam on this topic. So, for example, aquatic habitat in 1982, question 50. This will be our question one. How did they ask questions related to aquatic habitat? They say the absence of stomata shows that a leaf may be from a floating plant, from a submerged plant, from a variegated plant, from a terrestrial plant, from a parasitic green plant. Now, the answer to this question is B. The absence of stomata may show that the leaf is from a submerged plant. So in plants with floating leaves, stomata may be found only on the upper epidermis. So submerged leaves may lack stomata entirely. So the right answer to this question is B. Now, again, like remember the syllabus asks you to know what organism you'll find in different habitats. So it's very important and you can always use if you know two organisms, you don't need to know everything. Take, for example, this second question. Which of this group of animals is likely to be found in fresh water? Which of these will you find in fresh water? So I'll, I'm going to answer this question using elimination method. I'm going to answer this question using the elimination method. Okay, so first and foremost, you know that scorpion is not found in fresh water. You often find, find scorpion in a dry or moist place. I mean, a dry or moist atmosphere, I mean, um, habitat. All right. Maybe if you, um, if you have kept log of wood somewhere for too long, if you raise it up, you can, you can find scorpion under it. It's not in the fresh, it's not in fresh water habitat. Now, using that method, you know that any option that carries scorpion will be eliminated, right? So I've taken out option A and option C using that method. But now if you look at quest options, option B and option D, then look again, you will see ant lion. Again, ant lion cannot be found in freshwater habitat. So this is also any option with ant lion will also be eliminated. Now, if we haven't done this now, we're left with option B. Bloodworm, pond skater, and dragonfly lava. And that is the right answer. B is the right answer. Question number three, the salinity in brackish environment increases immediately after rain, increases at the end of rainy season, decreases with increase in microorganism, increase during the dry season. The right answer to this question now would be D. I mentioned that earlier in the note. So first, brackish water is formed when fresh water and seawater mixes, for example, at estuaries, which is an intersection between fresh and um, marine habitat. So when you have fresh water, seawater mixing at estuaries, brackish water is formed. Now this brackish water has salinity, which fluctuates with tides, wet and dry season. For example, in the lagoon, the salinity of the water increases during the dry season. Salinity increases during the dry season. Look at the option. And of course, salinity will decrease during the rainy season. So the right answer is D, and that is the rationale. Now let's look at question number four. Plant adapted for life in salty marsh are called A, hydrophyte, B, xerophyte, C, allophyte, and D, epiphyte. So you must understand the way plants are described based on their adaptation to different environments. Of course, if you have a plant that can that is adapted to aquatic habitats, that will be hydrophyte, right? If you have a plant that is adapted to dry habitat, that will be called xerophyte. If you have a plant that is adapted to a plant with, which depends on another plant for support only, it is called epiphyte, isn't it? And a plant that um, a plant that um, adapts to salty environment is called allophyte. From the word halo means salt. Remember your chemistry. 
group 7 in the periodic table they are called allergens right because they are salt formers so the word allo means salt the right answer is c question number five a freshwater plant such as water lily can solve the problem of buoyancy by possession of erenchymatous tissue dissected leaf thin cells on the of the epidermis water repelling epidermis now for some of you the answer is, is a giveaway because this name if you if you know it you just know what it means erenchymatous tissues that's the answer to this question now erenchymatous tissues are tissues of thin walled cells with large air field intercellular species that are found in roots and stems of some aquatic and marsh plants and they are used for buoyancy question number six the stem of a typical aquatic plant usually usually have many a air cavity b intercellular species c water cavities d water conducting cells the stem of a typical aquatic plant will have air cavities or air field intercellular spaces which enhances their buoyancy in order to float on on water so remember if you feel anything with air it can easily float on water and some plants have developed this um this um over the over the years they've developed this um this tissue or system or these organs and that is what erenchymatous tissues are they are air field that makes whatever that makes plants to float on water so roots commonly found in red mangrove are a buttress root b breaching root c clasping root and d stilt root so i would want you to understand one concept many years ago when i was writing jam this question i know it would i mean it would usually come out in jam exam and there was a way i i kept on remembering it so for this question seven you have stilt roots are found in red mangrove and it enables it to stand firm in strong ocean wind if you know what a red mangrove is i can just put up a picture of a red mangrove for you quickly i think that would help your understanding so this is what a red mangrove looks like i'll quickly show you this image Take a look at this. This is what a red mangrove looks like. And this root is known as um, this root is called a stilt root. So you can see that it enables the plant to stand firm in strong ocean. You can see how deep it is down into the into the water. Can, can you see my cursor? This is what a stilt root looks like, and this is a, a red mangrove. Okay, so it keeps um the plant firm in strong ocean wind and it also keeps the branches above the high tide level it's a very strong root all right now if you consider another um habitat called the white mangrove now that's for the red mangrove take a look at the, the steel root now let, let's look at a white mangrove let's look at the white mangrove now look at this I'm going to show you the picture and compare that to the red mangrove. All right, this is a white mangrove. So what is the difference between this and this? You can see this tree. This is in water for the red mangrove, and this is the white mangrove. You can see it doesn't have water; it's just on dry land. So what you have here in the white mangrove is called a pneumatophore. It's called a pneumatophore or breathing root and it allows the plant to take atmospheric air it allows the plant to breathe so that's the difference between the white mangrove which has a breathing root in this case and the red mangrove which has the steel root that allows it to build stamina and be able to withstand the water current let's go back to our notes now the production of viviparous seedling is an adaptive feature of mangrove forest plant rainforest plant savanna plant desert plant the answer to this question is a again in the mangrove plant the seed will germinate on the parent that is they are viviparous and develop a very long radical so 
that's another thing you find in the mang mangrove plant. Now, question, so that's A. Question number nine. Pneumatophore are adaptations for breeding. We just mentioned that for white mangrove. The answer is B. Question 10. Species diversity is highest in which of these habitats? Of course, I bet it's the rainforest because there are lots of um, there are lots of species in the rainforest than in other habitats. Because you remember you're coming from the marsh to the rainforest, from the rainforest to the grassland, from the grassland to the arid land. And in all of them, it's a rainforest that has ideal temperature, ideal water content, ideal um, environment. So as a result of that, there are lots of organisms, animals and plants alike in the rainforest. Question number 11. In a typical freshwater habitat, the edge of the stream or pond constitutes in a typical water habitat. So what you have in the edge of a stream or pond constitutes what you call the, the littoral zone. It constitutes the littoral zone. The answer is C. Question number 12. Tilapia is found in fresh water. The question says, which of the following organism is found in marine habitat? Tilapia, you find it in fresh water. That's why you can, you can have um, a fish farm and grow tilapia. You don't have to put salt in the water, do you? Because they're found in fresh water. True? Right. Now, which of these is mainly found in marine? Let's look at the other options. You have dogfish. You have dogfish. You also have, I don't know what this looks like. Then you also have the tortoise. Of course, you know that you have tortoise on land and in fresh water. Tortoise is not also in the marine. And you have this name, Achatina. It should actually be italicized. This is the, the zoological name for the land snail. So if you look critically, the right answer to this would be the dogfish. So sometimes you may not even even if you have not come across um, the organism before or an option before, you can always use this elimination method to take out what you're familiar with and leave out what you're not familiar with. Now, but for the purpose of education, this is what a dogfish looks like. So you can find it in a freshwater habitat. So the right answer to that question is B. Dogfish is found mainly in marine. Question number 13. In a savanna ecosystem, the abiotic factor include what is abiotic? The non-living component. So let's eliminate legume is plant. It's a living thing. A is can be right. Now in abiotic I mean, in savanna ecosystem, you have water, you have temperature, you have soil. Now, let's look at other options. Mineral, oxygen, reptiles. Water, soil, grasses. So, reptile is wrong. Grasses is wrong. I mean, another way to eliminate, right? So, the right answer to this question is um, B. Let's go on to question number 14. Which of the following plants is most adapted to the grassland ecosystem? So, which of them is most adapt adapted to the grassland ecosystem? You have the myogani. Myogani, you find them in the rainforest. These are big, massive trees. True. So, um, you need to look out for plants that can do, for example, the baobab tree. We normally call them bamboo tree. <laughs> you, need, you need water to actually grow this. This will be found in the rainforest as well. So now, well, we know that Maogani is found in rainforest. You know that Baobab is found in rainforest. We're left with pine and big palm. Which of them we have to now eliminate. So in the exam now, you, you know that you have these two. I'm trying to remember pine. Where do we find pine? Is it even in the rainforest? Or, yes, I think it's in the rainforest as well. Or in the estuary? Or in the marshland? But what is interesting here is that the answer is, um, is date palm. But I'm trying to see other ways to eliminate and be left with date palm. So date palm thrive best in almost rainless districts, like in grassland and in the desert. Remember, this you usually find this growing in the north. And you know what in the northern Nigeria, for example, it's a dry 
land. And also it's imported from a country like Saudi Arabia, which is also um, predominantly dry. Okay, question number 15. The most important adaptation required by terrestrial organism is the ability to, is it to search for food? Is it to escape from predator? Is it to conserve water? Is it to procure space? Okay, so search for food. Ability to search for food. Of course, some some uh, that are terrestrial organisms. Well, some organisms will, will remain on the same spot and they're able to get their food on the same spot. Escape from predator. Well, some will not escape. You also have um, conserve water, and also we have um, what else? Okay, yeah. So what I have here is the water conservation as the the right answer and this is my own explanation water conservation is an important adaptation required by terrestrial organisms particularly in the sahel savanna and in in the desert you know um terrestrial organism could be in the marsh they could be in the in the tropic rainforest they could be in the grassland they could be in the desert true now what what is what do you notice what's the common trend if you move across the terrestrial habitat, you will see the increased increasing dryness as you move from marsh to arid land. And what does that tell you? Water continues to reduce as you move across from marsh to arid land. So water conservation is an important, important adaptation required by terrestrial organism. So, for example, now in the Sahel savanna and desert, water is rare. The organism will have to what? develop means of conserving water to survive in that kind of environment if you say food predator space they affect all organisms regardless of the habitat all right every other thing you have in the options like um, food water it doesn't matter where you are you will need to develop means to, to, to sort yourself out on that i mean that is common to every habitat but water conservation because of peculiarity of the different habitat organisms will have to survive and develop means of doing so do you agree with my answer so i go with c question 16 the most limiting factor in the terrestrial habitat is the most limiting factor high solar radiation radiator high wind action the availability of water fluctuating temperature again it will still be the availability of water so i'll go with c and then question 17, the most important ecological factor in an environment, in the terrestrial environment. Again, we're talking about water, 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 water. It will be rainfall. The answer is A. Agree? Now, question 18, the greatest hazard faced by terrestrial organism. Again, is what? Water, <laughs> dehydration. And that is the answer. And question 19, one adaptation showed by terrestrial plant for combating drought. Okay, I think this is talking about something else now. For combating drought, which is also adaptation for water conservation, right? Is poor development of conducting tissues, possession of shorter roots which are less branched. C, reduction of number of stomata on the leaves. And then D, reduction in the intake of water from soil by root. This would be reduction in the number of stomata on the leaves the idea of this is so that they will not transpire transpire is a lot of water from the leaves so if the, the stomata number is reduced then there will be less amount of transpiration going on so that water can be conserved so the answer to that is c now let's look at question number 20. in a forest habitat emergence are best described as layers of tall trees towering above others at intervals so if you have for example this is the the level of the plant in a in a forest in a rainforest for example at intervals you have some plants that are taller than the rest and then some other plant will be on the same level then at another point you have another plant taller than the rest some other plant taller than the rest so these plants are called emergent and the right answer to this question then is see the layers of tall trees towering above others at interval question 21 i would Add these two bonuses, right? 21, 22. A major difference between marine and freshwater habitat would be what's the major difference? 
salts? The right answer is D. Then question number 22. The most widespread arboreal mammal is the, the monkey. So that is the end of topic 17 of the jam syllabus. If you find this video useful, please subscribe, share, and like. And also you can comment in the comment section and let me know what you think about it. So in the next video, I'll be talking about something else. And that will be the topic 18 of the jam syllabus. I'll see you then. Bye for now.